speakers and other meetings as directed by the chair will be webcast, except in times of technological failure. Meeting recordings shall be made publicly available for later viewing. Okay. We, I, I, we're live I, I just received it. It actually from... worked. Yeah, it, it, it went through. I, I fixed it. <laughs> Thank you. But that's, that's a good fallback position. Thank you. So we are now live streaming, and I'd like to um, call the meeting to order. Got a thing up here on my screen, it won't go away. Um, okay, there it goes. Okay, so can I get a certification of quorum, please? Yes, we have a quorum. We currently have 16 members present. Perfect. So I'm going to have my chair's remarks here uh, at the beginning of this meeting. I'd like to welcome all the members and public to the meeting. Um, on June 18th, the provincial government announced a cabinet shuffle that included several new appointments and portfolios. The GRC is, GRCA is pleased to welcome the Honorable Dave Piccini as the newly appointed Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, as well as the Honorable Greg Rickford in his newly merged role as the Minister of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Rickford also remains appointed as the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. We also thank Minister Yabuski and Minister Yurik for their time in these roles. I attended a meeting last week of the Conservation Ontario where we continue, they continue to get their remarks ready for the deadline on the new regulations. So moving right into the agenda, I have a review of the agenda. Can I, uh, can I get a, I have a motion that the agenda for the Source Protection Authority meeting be approved as circulated. Moved by Bruce, seconded by Joan. Any opposed? Carried, thank you. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing and hearing none. Minutes of the previous minutes motion that the minutes of the Source Protection Authority meeting of April 23rd, 2021 be approved as circulated. Moved by Jerry, seconded by Sue. Any opposed? Carried, thank you. Uh, no business arising. Moving right down to correspondence, 10.1. A motion that the correspondence from the Lake Erie Region Source Protection Authority regarding the updated assessment report and source protection plan from the Shago Urban Developments regarding updates to the Grand River Source Protection Plan be received for information. And a mover for that. Moved by John, seconded by Dan. If there are no questions, are there any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Uh, moving along to reports, 12.1. A motion, this is a Bit of a long one, so bear with me here. Motion that the Grand River Source Protection Authority is satisfied. Well, actually, you all have that in front of you. The motion 12.1, submission of the, well, I better read it for the public, right? Motion that the Grand River Source Protection Authority is satisfied that the Lake Erie Region Source Protection Committee's revised, updated source protection plan for the Grand River Source Protection Area contains the components required by the Clean Water Act 2006 and Ontario Regulation 28707 general reg and that the Grand River Source Protection Authority is satisfied that the pre-consultation and public consultation for the revised updated Grand River Source Protection Plan meet the requirements met the requirements of the Clean Water Act 2006 and Ontario Regulation 287 general regulation that Lake Erie staff be directed to submit the revised updated Grand River Source Protection Plan to the Ministry of the Environment Conservation and Parks in accordance with section 34 of the Clean Water Act 2006 along with any comments received as part of the pre-consultation and public consultation, resolution of municipal council submitted to the source protection authority, comments from the Lake Erie Source Protection Committee and any other comments that the Grand River Source Protection Authority wishes to make. Can I get a mover for that, please? Moved by John, seconded by Michael. If there are no questions, any opposed? That is carried, thank you very much. And that, my friends, is the uh, source water protection meeting. I have a motion that the source protection authority meeting be adjourned. Moved by Michael, seconded by Bruce. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you very much. So now we'll move along to the general membership meeting unless anybody needs a break. It's been seven minutes. Okay, I'm gonna press on then. We call the meeting officially to order and I a certification of form again, please. Uh, yes, we currently have 
19 members present, so we do have more. Thank you. I've made my remarks. So review of the agenda. I have a motion that the agenda for the general membership meeting be approved as circulated, moved by Warren, seconded by Michael. Any opposed? Carried. Any declaration of pecuniary interest? Seeing and hearing none. Previous minutes, a motion that the minutes of the general membership meeting of May 25th, 2021 be approved as circulated, moved by John, seconded by Les. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. And moving now to the hearing of delegations. Um, we have a, a Grand Valley Trails Association. We're gonna pause while the uh, delegates join the meeting and then I'll uh, introduce them. So I see, I think you're all here. So this is a, a delegation from the Grand Valley Trails Association. We have Annie Cote, Cote Kennedy, president of the GVTA, Charles Whitlock, board member, and Laura Anders, board treasurer. Welcome to our meeting. Can you hear me? Good enough? All right. I'm just going to turn the floor over to you folks. I believe they have, is it five minutes? Every meeting is, yeah? 10, 10. 10 sorry. Uh, you share too many things, you get different times all over the place. Anyway, you have 10 minutes. Uh, welcome, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you. You'll have to unmute. There you so, go. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Great, thank you. And good morning, especially to uh, all the uh, Canadian uh, uh, team uh, supporters today. So happy to be with you. And I thank you for the opportunity to follow up on an issue that's very important to the Grand Valley Trail Association. And that's the Grand Valley Trail in the Alora Park Gorge. I've been advised of your bylaw requiring that new and relevant information be presented by returning delegations. So only new, I should say. So I've reviewed my last presentation and uh, the information I'm presenting today is new information uh, and based in some part by the, uh, in the content of the management report. So because the topic of agreements on GRCA property outside the Elora Gorge had some prominence in the management's report, I'd like to speak on this briefly. I'll start by saying that we were very happy to hear of the GRCA staff willingness to continue working to formalize a landowner agreement for the trail that is on GRCA lands outside the Elora Gorge Park. And by way of reference, the Grand Valley Trails is 250 kilometers and the club does not own any land. So we are very grateful to all private and public landowners who generously allow the trail to run on their property. We're particularly thankful to the Woolwich Township staff for driving this initiative and working with us and all landowners, including GRCA towards that end. Woolwich Township and the GVTA have over recent years been working in partnership to ensure that the trails are maintained and accessible to the people in our region. They have resources set aside to assist in the maintenance of the trails. So as a charitable organization, we're very much appreciative of that. And agreements such as these help formalize the understanding between organizations. They clarify each other's maintenance responsibilities. As you know, the trail has been in its pre present location for 49 years. So as time lapses, the institutional memory fades and, and the more formal documentation is really beneficial to all parties. So staff have indicated a commitment to continue discussions on other GRCA owned properties. However, it's not clear if staff are in support of having discussions relating to the trail within the Elora Gorge Conservation Authority. Uh, that commitment was not explicitly stated in their information document. And um, we, hope, we hope that that's, um, that they are committing to having these discussions. So while the work to formalize these agreements outside the Elora Gorge and the whole trail is continuing, the primary purpose in being here is really to focus on the trail in the Elora Gorge Park. Our objective in meeting with you earlier this spring and today is to request the Grand Valley Trail be allowed to continue to run through the park. We understand that staff are not supportive of entering into agreement to permit access at the previously agreed location. Uh, but that said, we believe the impasse can be solved by discussion. It's been one year uh, last month since we were told of your request to move the trail outside the park. 
And in that year, we've met once in September, uh, in person or rather virtually given the times. The meeting was followed by two emails received in response to our questions. So we believe that meeting in person or virtually offers the best forum to arrive at an agreement that's mutually acceptable. So since we've not been able to meet in person, we use this opportunity to clarify the points that were not explicitly articulated during our last delegation. So one is we support having a formal agreement in place. We support paying an annual fee to permit our hikers to hike on the section of the trail that is within the park. We support having an agreement that's strictly in effect during the regular park's regular operating or uh, operating hours. And we also support having an agreement that spells out our responsibility for trail maintenance. We hope to be able to have timely discussions to define the particulars relating to each of these. And that really takes us then to our proposal for a new trail access in the Allura Gorge Park. We were made aware of a new public entrance now in place through the staff's information package. And the previous existing entrance through the, the previous existing entrance to the park on the other side of the river made it impossible for the trail to be rerouted. However, we believe the entrance at Upper Pines provides an opportunity for the GVTA to reconsider the location of its access point to the park. So I see the map has been put up here. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to that. So to that end, and with the view of meeting the GRCA stated objectives, the GVTA would propose relocating the southern entrance of the trail in the park. That's the circled area you see on the map. Specifically, we would propose moving the trail from its current location along the river, which is on the left side of the screen of the um, picture you have. And instead, we'd run the trail along what we call the Blue Trail. And that's the trail that runs along the edge of the park to Middlebrook Road. So that's the image on the right. Moving the trail to this location means hikers would need to walk about 250 meters on Middlebrook Road to enter at the new official entrance at Upper Pines. And once into the park, hikers would be directed to walk on the existing marked and maintained Grand Valley Trail, which is located away from the gorge. And it's indicated in red on the right here. So if I can pause here for a moment as an aside and as it relates to capacity issues, it's important to note that hikers do not go to the park as a destination. Hikers walk through the park. They don't typically stay in the park. Also important to note that hikers are really good stewards of the trail. They abide by the trail users code. They carry their garbage out. They respect the environment. Um, really hikers should be seen as your allies. So I'm not going back to the trail description. Hikers ent entering then at the Upper Pines entrance that you see marked there, walk north to reconnect with the trail outside the park. We would propose the northern entrance currently off Middlebrook Road remain where it currently is in the interim. It's located about 600 meters from Highway 7 and the Ball Diamond. Now we recognize the location is not ideal because of the traffic on Middlebrook Road that was raised at your last meeting and that this entrance is not an official designated entrance. However, this entrance is used by hikers and it's a far less traveled and not well known entrance to weekend visitors to Alora, which we believe is the area that is problematic and that is causing uh, issues at the baseball diamond. This is being proposed as an interim solution to provide continued access for GVTA members in good standing. As discussions unfold between GRCA and the Township of Sender Wellington, as referenced in your uh, management document, as those discussions unfold toward a possible new official gate near the Ball Diamond on the corner of Middlebrook and Highway 7, GVTA will happily oblige to reroute or alter the main trail to connect with the new gate. If the reroute option is acceptable, we believe the change can be implemented relatively quickly. Should this be accepted, the route be accepted and the interim access point on the northern side of the section be accepted, we would develop and implement a detailed communication strategy to inform our members of the change. We would advise them to carry their GVTA identification when hiking through the park. We would let them know that it's important to show their GVTA valid GVTA membership if and when asked by GRCA personnel. 
We would also inform them of the dangers of the gorge and the importance of respecting the, the uh, park's operating hours. If the interim trail is not accepted, hikers coming from the northern part of our trail would need to walk on busy Middlebrook Road for about 3.5 kilometers to enter the park at Upper Pines entrance. Likewise, hikers coming from the south would need to walk about 3.5 kilometers on Middlebrook Road to rejoin the trail in Elora. We don't see that as a viable option. If an acceptable and sanctioned trail access cannot be identified on the northern section of the trail, it eff in effect, it means that you are kicking out the Grand Valley Trail out of the Elora Park. It means that hikers would walk 3.5 kilometers on a busy road adjacent, but outside one of the most beautiful areas of our region and of the province. Outside a park, where the vision for the trail originated and was conceived by one of your own members, a member of the GRCA Foundation. And this would occur on the 50th anniversary of the Grand Valley Trail Association. I have to tell you this change would be devastating for the club. And we believe it would, be a, it would have a significant reputational impact on the Grand River Conservation Authority. We really hope to have your support and endorsement of the rerouted trail as outlined and your help in identifying a northern access point if the temporary interim measures is not acceptable. We also hope that staff are committed to working with us to develop an agreement that preserves our longstanding history and offers hikers continued access to the trail running through the Elora Gorge Park. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that. Appreciate that. Um, are there any questions from members of the board? Warren? Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Um, I think this, uh, the Grand Railway Trails Association has certainly done a good job in being receptive to changes that have been proposed. I think they want to work with us. They have worked with us over the years and seeing the map, I think this looks like a very viable uh, way to solve uh, the problem for the, the authority and also for the Trails Association. They are, as was mentioned, stewards of the land. I know this group is very dedicated to picking up garbage, even if it's someone else's and lugging it out uh, to a proper receptacle. receptacle. Um, but I think um, this could be a win-win if we make the right decision to uh, go with the proposal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ian? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I echo uh, Warren's comments that um, what I'm hearing is that the GVTA Association is very committed to working with staff to um, find a resolution I'm certainly in favor of allowing the Middlebrook um, exit as an interim solution until such times as the township and GRCA staff are able to um, further discussions about having an official third entrance um, somewhere in the neighborhood of the Elora uh, Lions Park. Uh, one other thing I'll just put out there just as an idea is if staff are um, I guess, hesitant to use the Middlebrook entrance, whether or not they would consider access through the workshop gate on Waterloo Regional, or sorry, on uh, Wellington Road 7. It's an alternate location for staff to go through, or sorry, for um, hikers to go through. One other thing I just wanna throw out there as well is we, it was mentioned that the GVTA would consider paying a membership fee for members to go into the park would it be easier for staff if instead GVTA members were encouraged to either buy annual GRCA membership passes or to just pay a day fee as they enter the park at the Pine, the Pine entrance? Okay, Ian, thank you. And Bernie? Thank you very much. And listening to uh, 
the presentation. It sounds reasonable, and I would hope that uh, working with staff, they can come up with something that is doable. Thank you, sir. Sue? There we go. Um, through the chair, uh, it's, uh, can you hear me? Because it says I'm not yeah, muted. Yeah, okay, you're good. thank you. Um, I agree with Bernie. I think uh, staff should look at this option and uh, come up with a, a feasible plan. Um, entrances are difficult to monitor, separate entrances. Um, so, but it sounds like they're a decent group. So let's have staff look into this uh, situation and provide us with the pluses and the minuses, and then we can make a good decision. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to comment? All right, well, uh, thank can you for the delegation just... today. Staff, I heard, heard it, we all heard it, and you've had some input from the board, so we'll be certainly communicating with you very soon. Thanks, Sam, appreciate it. Thank uh, you. Chair, can I just uh, mention that if we want to be recognized uh, that we go to the reactions and, and raise our hands. And then um, if you have opened the participants, you the person at the top is the person that first put their hand up. And so yeah. it's easy, it makes it easier for everyone rather than trying to see a hand on the screen. I'm pretty flexible though, Sue, I can do both. Okay. Uh, I know, you're pretty good. <laughs> anyway, yeah, it's better if you put your hand up then I get it in order. And, and if I ever miss anybody and you know, it happens and hopefully we'll be out of this Zoomy thing, um, just jump up and down and I'll, uh, I'll see you. Okay, thank hey, you so very much. So, when in terms of Chris, you could say that he's ambidextrous. That's that's Chris I have that tattoo. Anything. All right, thank you very much. Thanks again for the uh, delegation. Appreciate it. So, thank moving you. right along to uh, ten point one, Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry correspondence. Uh, this is obviously a good news story. Uh, anytime we get some money, it's it's always good. We have a motion that the correspondence from the Minister of Natural Resources and forestry regarding 2021-2022 water erosion control infrastructure funding be received as information. Uh, can I get a mover for that, please? Moved by Ian, second by Les. Are there any questions? Are there any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Moving on to 12.1, the minutes of the Ad Hoc Conservation Authorities Act Committee. So if you recall, at the end of last year, the beginning of this year, with the with the new regs and everything coming through, we struck a, a smaller committee to try to get some focus on this huge, huge thing we have coming at us. And uh, we, we did have a meeting and the minutes are there for you. And, you know, we reviewed the mandatory, non-mandatory things, the changes to recreation and um, education and questions around source water funding, whether they're going forward. So we had a, a pretty good discussion and uh, we'll continue to work on the details of this as it comes forward, I will read the motion and then open the floor. I have a motion that the minutes of the Ad Hoc Conservation Authorities Act Committee held on June 15th, 2021 be received for information. Moved by Ian, seconded by Bruce. Are there any comments or questions here? Uh, Bruce? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, going through, and, and I, I must uh, compliment staff for the, the report that you have put together. And it, it's, it seems to be fairly complex, but the one thing that keeps jumping out at me is the provincial government's uh, determination to have a one source, uh, one point source of dealing with uh, official plans and planning act uh, issues. And somewhere in there, it states that they, GRCA or conservation authorities would be asked to comment on it or provide recommendations, but the government could pick and choose which recommendations it would accept or which ones it would use. And, and to me, that's kind of defeating the purpose of a non-government agency with the expertise to evaluate uh, these issues, uh, putting their time into making those comments if they're not going to be taken and, and decisions are not based on science. I don't think it should ever become political decisions that, are, that determine how official policies or, or land use is determined. So I, I'm not sure how you deal with it, um, but 
that that's the one point that just jumped out at me uh, every time I read through it. Okay, and you know what? I probably, I kind of got ahead of myself because we've got this on here, but Sam's got a presentation for comments on the report. Perhaps, where is that, Sam? That's coming up. It's the next report. Okay, so if, if with all due respect, can we hold the questions until she does her presentation, and then we'll go back into it. And just as an aside, while we're, while we're at this, um, we are of course going to send a letter of appreciation for the old minister and welcome the new minister and. John had a great idea that we we asked them if they might, you know, indulge us with a little Zoom meeting so we can talk directly to the new minister about some of the concerns we have. But I apologize for that. We do have a report coming up, a presentation. So why don't we do that? And then we'll get into the broader discussion because some of the questions may uh, be answered. Are there any concerns about that? Okay, I'm going to do that. So I'm going to, let's get this motion through uh, on the ad hoc committee. So I'm looking for a motion. Okay. So you, uh, Ian and Bruce moved and seconded. Right. Are there any opposed to the approval of those minutes? Thank you. Okay. So moving along to 12.2, uh, I have a motion that report number GM 062149, Environmental Registry Posting 0192986, Regulatory Proposal Phase One under the Conservation Authorities Act be received as information and that the Grand River Conservation Authority report GM 062149 be submitted to the province through environmental registry. I'll put it on the floor and then we'll get the presentation. Moved by Sue, seconded by Ian. Okay, Sam, sorry to get in front of you there. I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So today I'm just going to give a high level summary of the comments that uh, GRC staff are recommending that the board approve to submit to the environmental registry posting regarding the regulatory proposals for the first phase of the regulations to implement the changes that were made to the Conservation Authorities Act through a number of different bills. So the next slide just highlights um, that uh, we've had a number of bills and changes to the Conservation Authorities Act for a number of years. So we've been in a state of flux basically for probably about the last six years. So the first bill was passed um, in 2017, so Bill 139. Um, and that was more focused on the enforcement tools that the Conservation Authority had. So that's where the uh, government put in the act that we had the ability to um, issue stop work orders and increase the fines. It's just those sections weren't, weren't proclaimed at that point. Um, then the new government that came in in 2009, they passed Bill 108. And subsequent to that, we had the passing of Bill 229, which contained a number of amendments uh, to the Conservation Authorities Act. Um, and that passed at the end of the year in December. Um, so there were a number of changes that were made to the Act as well as um, that came into effect right away. A number of them um, were yet to be proclaimed. As part of um, the process in 2021, early 2021, that was when MECP formed the Conservation Authorities Working Group. And this was a group that was supporting MECP staff and the minister in terms of reviewing and providing advice on the upcoming regulations that were to come out. So you may recall that there's two phases of regulation and this is the first phase of regulation. The overall focus of these changes was to kind of improve governance, transparency, consistency, and accountability amongst the CAs. So the first phase that happened was um, in the beginning of February where the um, sections of the act that were related to governance and transparency um, came into effect. So that was around the 70% requirement for municipal representatives around the, the horseshoe, as well as the timelines for and rotation for the chair and the vice chair. So throughout January, the uh, working group has been meeting and consulting with the minister and his staff on the first guide that was released in May. And so that's the guide that um, we're going to be 
talking about today and the comments that staff are preparing to recommend to the board to submit. So you may recall that there's three different buckets of programs and services now that the government is going to require through regulations to categorize each of those. So the mandatory programs and services um, have contained risks of natural hazards are functions that are required under the Clean Water Act for source water protection. There's the Lake Simcoe Act, which is inapplicable to us, land management. And then through the working group, they've added two additional uh, mandatory programs, which is the watershed-based resource management strategy, and then the provincial water quality and quantity monitoring, which includes surface and groundwater. So these are the programs and services that are mandatory, which means that we can apply levy dollars to these programs. So the second and third bucket are considered non-mandatory programs. And the first one is programs where the municipality requests the conservation authority to provide. So examples of these programs are the restoration and stewardship, tree planting and forest management, planning on the natural heritage side of things, um, wetland enhancement and restoration. And so finally, the third bucket, I guess we refer to for the non-mandatory programs and services are ones that the authority or the board um, decides as programs that they'd like to use levy dollars towards. So these contain education, um, resource development, so hydro generation, recreation, purchasing of land and non-mandatory research projects. So these, uh, the non-mandatory, so the two buckets of the non-mandatory programs require that the Conservation Authority get into agreements with the municipalities regarding the allocation of levy dollars to support these programs. So this is where the municipalities can determine whether or not they want to participate in that program and service. If they do, then we go through a process of negotiating the MOU and their councils have to endorse those MOUs. So this just sort of highlights um, at a really high level, the timelines that are required for us to come into conformance with the regulations that will come out of phase one. So in the beginning part, you can see we have to go through a process of defining what are mandatory and non-mandatory programs. This transition plan is required um, by the end of the year, we have to submit it to MECP and it just lays out sort of the process that we're going to go through in terms of determining the non-mandatory and mandatory programs, how we're going to approach the municipalities um, in terms of entering into MOUs with them, how we're going to consult with the municipalities to do that. It also requires that we take a look at the way in which we budget and the allocation of levy dollars towards which programs. Um, and we have to have a list and sort of a status update in terms of the process of getting into the MOUs with the municipalities. One of the big challenges for the GRCA is we have a number of municipalities within our watershed. So 38 municipalities, 21 participating municipalities. And at this point in time in the document, it says that we can negotiate with participating municipalities. But for some of the programs and services, we may also have municipalities who aren't necessarily the levy paying or municipal, um, the levy paying municipalities or the participating municipalities. We're uh, part of the request we put into the MECP is for clarification that we can still get into MOUs with other municipalities who may not be the participating municipalities. So that has to be submitted by the end of December and we have an internal um, committee that we're starting up um, of senior staff to start working on that transition plan. As well, you may notice in the um, minutes of the ad hoc meeting, there was the request that we continue with that committee just because of the timelines and the steps for negotiations and um, the ability for staff to seek advice uh, from the board and from the committee. Um, we had asked that we continue with meeting with that ad hoc committee throughout the process, as well as providing updates to the board as well. So then once we get the submission of that plan and that, then we have a year basically to come into conformance. Um, we have to refine our budgets, um, provide the new format and be in, have all the MOUs in place and ready to go um, for January 1st, 2023. 
One of the other requirements that's been highlighted um, in the consultation package is the requirement for the community advisory boards. In terms of the purpose of these boards, it's to provide advice and recommendations to the authority on the authority's strategic priorities and associated policies, programs, and services. So this was um, put in the legislation, I think, prior to, I'm trying to think which bill it came through, but it, it, it was in the legislation already. Um, and so we had amended our bylaws to reflect the ability to do that. The difference now is that the government is requiring or passing a regulation that requires us to form one of these boards. Um, in terms of what the government will prescribe from an accountability perspective, is really similar to what the board has. So they want to have um, meetings. There will be a chair, vice chair, secretary, treasurer. We'll have to post the minutes online um, and basically have similar attendance requirements and code of conduct requirements as well. One of the things, one of the things that, um, yeah, so there's, sorry, there's an outline. So they're setting a minimum number of members to this committee. Um, the public is permitted to sit on this committee. There will be a requirement to notify the public of appointments um, onto this committee. And obviously CAE staff are to provide administrative support um, to this uh, board as well. One of the things that um, the government is proposing though is that the GRCA board would be able to develop and have influence over the terms of reference um, for this committee. So when the meetings occur, the duration of appointments, the number of members, activities, functions, and the duties and procedures. So just a reminder in terms of the process, we did come to the board last month to notify you that the um, consultation guide is up and is uh, there for consultation. The government provided 45 days in which to submit um, comments. So we did have a meeting of the ad hoc committee and today we're presenting um, the draft comments which incorporated comments previously received from the board meeting as well as the ad hoc committee meeting. Um, so the comments that are attached in the package today are the ones that staff are recommending to submit to MECP. And then the date for the final submission for comments is on June 27th. So in terms of next steps, um, one of the things I did want to highlight was that there's still the consultation guide that will be coming out for the update to Section 28 regulation. Um, my understanding from MNRF is that that consultation guide will be posted to the ERO in the next coming week. So that will be another one that will be coming to the board um, to provide an update on and to get feedback in terms of commenting on that. But in terms of the information that we presented in the consultation guide, um, we have a number of steps that we need to go through in order to meet the regulations once they come out. So again, it's the creation of that transition plan that has to be submitted by December 31st, 2021. We need to negotiate and enter into MOUs with municipalities regarding the non-mandatory programs and services and have those in effect by January 1st, 2023. We need to create and oversee a public advisory board. We need to develop and update a core watershed-based resource management strategy. From the GRCA's perspective, we have the water management plan, which provides a great foundation for the creation of that strategy. Um, we need to develop a strategy for all of the Conservation Authority owned lands or controlled lands. We need to update the land acquisition policy or strategy as well as develop a disposition strategy. And then we need to develop land management plans for each of the properties that the authority owns. So with that, Mr. Chair, that's the summary of the comments that are attached in the package today. If there's any questions or additional comments that the board would like to make, um, we'd be happy to hear them. Okay, thank you, Sam. Great presentation. I think it gives a pretty good synopsis of what we're facing here. Uh, I'll take questions from the floor, starting with Catherine. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. And through you, uh, Mr. Chair, 
having spent uh, an enormous amount of work on the previous iteration of the Conservation Authority uh, Act, I find it, um, uh, I guess, distressing that um, this organization has been dismantled into these three buckets. The one thing that I find is, I mean, just as an example, is fairly short-sighted in the document, and it's really a comment more than anything else, the invasive species uh, issues along the watershed can be potentially quite uh, threatening and damaging to uh, our complete watershed. And I find it short-sighted that it's in a non-mandatory bucket that's just kind of left hanging to the individual municipality. Invasive species in, in particular need a coordinated effort through all municipalities. So that's really my comment on that piece. Um, I think given the short time frame, I have every confidence in this organization and our board in order to make the, um, the comments and the deadlines. But I do appreciate the incredible amount of work that it takes, not just from staff, but from all municipalities who are concerned about um, what's proposed here. Um, I do just want to acknowledge and the amount of work that's going to take to to meet these timelines and and get something that works for the entire watershed. I think the general public understands the issue of cumulative effects and the fact that what happens in the top of the watershed ends up spreading down to uh, the bottom of the watershed and and that's just um, just one issue that I'm really concerned about. Uh, I'll remain available to assist in any way I can in order to try and get the work uh, forwarded. Thanks. Thank you and appreciate appreciate that offer. We have Jane. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair White. And um, I guess I agree with, with Catherine about the non-mandatory. Um, I'm concerned about uh, our, our really good programs, our rural water quality programs and the uh, uh, the various, you know, tree planting and all that. Now, a lot of that isn't covered by the levy right now, but certainly municipalities are, are you know, part of that. I, I'm also concerned, and I'm sure this came up when I was not able to be here last month, that uh, I have a feeling it's sort of a download to the municipalities somehow, or that things will be dropped off if municipalities don't agree. There seems to be a lot of, of stuff, and we've got municipalities that can handle it, and municipalities that can't, and I just, yeah, I, I just find it, I also feel that there's a lot of busy work going on here, particularly for GRCA where we're fo so far ahead on a lot of this and that's my concern. Thanks, Jane. John? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the, what has happened since uh, the ad hoc committee met really is, is uh, the change in minister. And I'm gonna suggest that we not, you know, take our foot off the gas pedal but I think, as you know, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, it's, it's quite common when there's a change in minister, there's a change in focus. And, and, and at times, uh, you know, the premier or the prime minister will view it as a chance to do a reset. And so there may be an opportunity for a bit of a reset on this legislation, or there may be none. But uh, I suspect uh, that there may be a little bit of a reset but we have to continue along the path that there is no reset, but there may be some good news. Yeah, I, I, and I think that's an excellent point. A, a change in minister may be a change in all kinds of stuff. That's why, you know, with, with your suggestion, we're going to reach out to them and see if they'll meet us face to face. They may or may not, but at least with our submissions in that, they may get a different set of eyes. Um, is there anyone else who would like to comment who doesn't have their hand up, who wants to wave at me? I don't, I don't, Ian, did you want to say something or are you just waving at me? <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair White. Um, I have a question. Do you have an estimate of the labor requirements and costs to uh, meet the province's expectations in terms of providing all this information and meeting with communities to establish these MOUs? I mean, my concern is, is this going to take our existing staff away from their other um, current duties in order to focus on completing this? I'll let, let Sam answer that, but I'll just try to touch it a little bit. I don't think we're absolutely sure because this is going to depend. I think that this is frankly going to be a mess, especially when we've got so many municipalities to deal with. All you're going to need, and many of us are from 
municipal councils, if you have a couple of councillors who aren't on board or a couple of issues, you could end up hashing out an issue for six months. I mean, and you could have a scenario where you've got something that crosses four municipalities, three of them love it, you went through it in three minutes, and the guy right in the middle doesn't want to do it for whatever reason. So I, I think the amount of effort, time and staff is going to be unbelievable. There's an additional burden they've put on there where we're supposed to report back to the province every quarter on, on our progress. And I, you know, my question to that, well, are you going to help us then or step in? So I think Sam may be able to answer it, but I think this is, and this is frankly going to take probably a lot of the board members help as well, because we're going to be dealing with the municipalities that you represent. So I don't think we know. All I can tell you is my own experience, even with just things as simple as a budget, we have to go out and explain it to councils and walk through it and there's questions. So when you get down to, my fear is this, um, we're gonna show up at a council and say, we used to provide this recreation service off the levy. Now, if we can't get user pays from the user, the municipality is gonna step up. If I'm on that council, the answer is gonna be, we're not paying for conservation services. Like you're going to get that argument and, and it's going to be difficult, right? So I think part of what's going to have to happen here is the messaging back to the folks in the province that this isn't us removing these services. It's going to be difficult to get uh, the, the municipalities to justify using property tax dollars to move into things that were traditionally with the Conservation Authority. So Sam, I don't know if you have any thoughts on resources required. <laughs> Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that was a good summary. We also set up the transition reserve last year, which we put um, some surplus dollars in, and that's to help us with any legal or accounting or additional expenses, consulting expenses that we need to help support staff um, as we move through this process as well. So, so we'll keep the board informed as we move along. And if we need additional resources, we're going to come back and ask for them. I'll, I'll take Ian to, as a follow-up, then I'll get you there, Guy. Go ahead, Ian. Uh, thank you, Chair White. I guess um, one question I have is, do, will this impact our um, trailways? So I'm thinking of the Lark Cataract Trailway, the Cambridge to Hamilton Trailway. Who wants to take that? Well, I can start. Um, through you, Mr. Chair. So yes, the province has identified that any recreational activities are not considered mandatory and fall into the non-mandatory buckets. So um, I think once, once these regulations come into play and we actually see the details in terms of what the requirements are and what the definitions are, that will help in terms of moving forward with negotiating the MOUs with the municipalities. But the challenge is going to be that um, unless we have agreements in place, we can't use levy dollars towards supporting recreational programs and services. So bottom line is some things may go away. If, if you can't use levy dollars and there's no other funding source and the users aren't prepared to put in a fee and the municipality won't put the dollars up, there's some of the dilemmas we're facing. Uh, so we'll have to one step at a time. Guy? Thank you, Chris. Um, I, I just want to echo about the, in my mind, this is just an administrative nightmare trying to do this. And the concept of um, reducing red tape or streamlining thing, this does not, uh, doesn't work for me when, when, with what is being proposed. My other concern is the source water protection and the levy. And, and I still, when I read this, it, it just makes no sense how they're even considering uh, any alternative other than for them to continue to fund it, but there, it's would apply. It, it would appear that they may be um, proposing that it become uh, downloaded to the conservation authority. So um, I don't. I, I just throw that out, out as comments. Thanks. And, and I, that's a very valid concern. I mean, ultimately, follow it through. If they drop the funding and the funding comes from the conservation authority, bottom line, it's back on the property tax. So call that what you may. Richard? Thank you. I'm just, uh, I, I agree with everything that's been said. I, I think this is a divide and conquer approach to have uh, those services disappear as one municipality and two municipalities and, and so on, start uh, cutting that from their budgets in a tight budget year. I'm wondering if we couldn't get an MOU for all the municipalities and, and the watershed that agree to fund these services and add them to the levy. So that would be your MOU, just a thought. Yeah, so Sam may be able to answer that. I, we probably have to have every municipality sign off. So 
that's fundamentally what we're going to be doing. We're going to have to have MOUs. What, and you, I doubt very much you're going to have one watershed wide MOU, but at the end of the day, that's kind of where you're going to be. You'll yeah, I'm kind of wondering if that would be, you know, it, that would be signed on to and you wouldn't have to do it annually. You would have it signed on to unless another mis, an, a municipality decided to raise it as, as declining from that offer. Well, and that's, so these are all the things we're going to have to try to sort out. Uh, I'm with you. What happens when you get a new council? How long are these MOUs in place? Another, another service comes along. I mean, guys absolutely bang on. You might as well hire 10 people to, to just monitor this, right? It's, it's, it's a monster. And I, you know what? Staff, uh, I'll just, bluntly, what I'm looking at, we may need to give staff some more resources. You may end up with a, a municipal relations something. I don't, we'll have to see how it goes. Um, Sue? Yes, we discussed a common MOU to put out to all the municipalities um, at the ad hoc meeting. Um, it would have to be, no council will commit a future council, so it would have to be done every term of council. And it is a logistics nightmare and a cost of fortune. If um, the ministry can see what they're putting us through and the potential losses, I would hope in common sense would prevail. I'm not sure it will, but as... Um, I spoke to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forest and stated in the past, how do you want your Ontario to look? What do you perceive as Ontario? You are the guardianship of Ontario. What are you doing? And how do you perceive it? Will you and your family and all your friends all of a sudden not be allowed to use these trails because you put this and mandated in and your municipalities either couldn't afford the legal cost or whatever? I don't think they understand the ramifications of what they said and did. You know, I think they um, got caught up in paperwork and, and uh, logistics and other GRCAs and the problems they're having and dumped this. And, and this province several times have made huge errors and months later stepped back and said, oops, okay, we're going to take that out now. So I think we have to be forward with the province and say, you know, are you aware of the ramifications? And put it out in black and white for them and say, okay, are you going to... Uh, you've laying on a huge cost are you going to subsidize this cost for the grca because this you know this is something you're mandating and there's options but we have to go back to the ministry and ask for logic and and their vision of ontario what is their legacy for ontario because that's exactly what this is what is their legacy or not in ontario and in their conservation authorities all right thank you for those comments, Sue, is there anything further? Obviously, this is a, a work in action. Joan? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there any way we could speak to um, the minister at the AMO conference, or do you think it's too late to um, have an audience? I, I, he's brand new, um, you know, I, I think it's a great idea. I don't know. I haven't seen the um, uh, drop dead on um, applications to meet ministers yet. So we'll I keep an eye open for that. And I think, especially with a new minister, I think we absolutely need to make that request, certainly. Um, and staff will make a note of that. Right? Can we make a note of that? And as soon as that comes out, when they offer to set up delegations, and I know that AMO has been flooded, especially during these virtual conferences so hopefully we'll get a spot but that's a great idea joan and we'll have that in fact is the way forward with a lot of this stuff right roma amo whatever we can get back in front of the minister because i don't think that the, we're heading into a provincial election there's a lot of stuff here this is going to end up being reopened again and again because it'll be too messy anyway is there anything further uh bruce and then i'll get you sue go ahead bruce thanks again uh, chair chris um I won't repeat the, the point I made earlier. I think uh, it's probably been talked about uh, at, in your committee. The, a couple other things. Uh, first of all, I think you're absolutely right. It's a, a time there could be a shift, uh, your, your comment and John's, in attitude by a minister, but that won't happen if we don't keep pushing. So I think it's important that we keep pushing uh, with our comments. The other one that I, I really don't agree with, and I think I, when you meet virtually, you don't have a chance to talk to the other farm representatives, but uh, a token 
uh, member designated or an agricultural member designated on a board is not the way to deal with issues in agriculture. It, uh, especially if you don't have the same voting rights, you, you also put all of that uh, responsibility on one member rep in a, representing a pretty wide variety, variation in agricultural issues across watersheds and, and even within our watersheds. So I think, I think you get your representatives from the municipalities that are in that watershed. And if they want a agriculture representation, they'll make sure they appoint someone from their council or select one in the watershed that could represent them. So uh, I agree with the other comments. It's, it is gonna be a nightmare and I don't see any solution without them retracting some of the things they're trying to do. I look at all of the programs we have and even our tree planting, our education programs, our recreation programs, we're still promoting the, the appreciation of the environment and the concern of the hazards and also the whole thing about climate change. So we could probably put everything into that one bucket if we, if we stretch the purpose of the programs that we have. So maybe that's our long-term objective. Okay, thanks, Bruce. So if the, Sue, Last comment, and then we're going to move on. Go ahead. Thanks, Chris. Just I thought that the delegations for AMA was closed now. Well, I, that's, I don't know. I think it's closed. Are because they? I've got my confirmations. Okay. So. But, 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 Chris, there's nothing wrong with us asking to be a delegate at another time to meet one to one with the minister. And it gives us more time. Yeah. Well, we're going to put it in our letter of congratulations in the appointment, and we're going to make a point of indicating we'd like to, to have a meeting. I mean, we're a big player in this game. And I think that at the end of the day, they really should have a chat with us, right? It's, it's only respectful. Okay, so I have the motion on the floor. I don't think anybody needs me to read it again. Are there any opposed? That is carried, thank you very much. And Sam and staff, uh, you know, anything you need from the border, any way we can support you, this is gonna be a long road. Okay, moving right along to 12.3. Uh, Conservation Ontario Governance Accountability and Transparency Initiative. This is, this is another one of these legislative requirements. I will just read this here. Uh, whereas the provincial government has passed legislative amendments related to the governance of conservation authorities, and whereas the Grand River Conservation Authority remains committed to fulfilling accountability, accountable and transparent governance. Therefore, be it resolved that the Grand River Conservation Authority endorsed the three key actions developed by the Conservation Ontario Steering Committee to update Conservation Authority bylaws, to report proactively on priorities and to promote and demonstrate results. And that staff be directed to work with Conservation Ontario to implement these actions and to identify additional improvements and best management practices. Can I get a mover for that, please? Moved by Bernie, seconded by Richard. Comments? Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Moving along, I know Helen will get excited about this one. Moving along to 12.4, I have a motion that the human resources policy dated June 21st, 2021 be approved and implemented. Can I get a mover for that, please? Helen, moved by Helen, seconded by Warren. Any questions, comments? Any opposed? That is carried, thank you very much. Uh, there's some really good things in there on social media, I think that's... It's good that we're keeping up with that. 12.5. Uh, this is basically housekeeping to some degree. I have a motion that the following new members be appointed to Grand River Conservation Foundation for a term of three years. Ankar Gupta, and that the following members be reappointed to Grand River Conservation Foundation for a term of three years. Floyd Davis, Paul General, Kathy Reston, and that the following members be reappointed to the Grand River Conservation Foundation for a term of one year. Joel Doherty, James De Oden. Uh, can I get a mover for that, please? Moved by John, seconded by Brian. Uh, any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Cash and investment status. I have a motion that report number GM 0621 cash and investment status, May 2021 be received as information. Moved by Jerry, seconded by Sue. Questions? Uh, any opposed? Carried, thank you. Financial summary for the period ended May 31st, 2021. Motion 
that the financial summary for the period ending May 31st, 2021 be approved. Moved by Joan, seconded by Ian. Questions? Any opposed? Carried. Maintenance agreement, County of Brent. Motion that the Grand River Conservation Authority enter into a maintenance agreement with the County of Brant for the lands known as the Paris properties described as part lots of 32, 33, 34, and 35 concession one, South Dumfries, Paris, County of Brant. Moved by Brian, seconded by Joan. Any questions? Any opposed? Carried, thank you. Provincial Offenses Act 12.9 motion that the Grand River Conservation Authority appoints Brad, Brad Kuntz and Kathleen Rosebra as Provincial Offenses Act officers to enforce section 29 of the Conservation Authorities Act. Moved by Les, seconded by Ian. Questions opposed? Uh, is there a question? Brian? No, okay, sorry, you're, I saw your thumb. Okay, any opposed? That is carried. Please keep your digits away from the camera. All right, moving along to 12.10. Uh, a motion that the report, uh, so this is with regards to the Lower Gorge Conservation Grand Valley Trails Association, that report number GM 062145, a Lower Gorge Conservation Area Grand Valley Trail Association access request be received for information. Moved by Ian, seconded by Bob. I got you, Bob, you rubbed your nose. Seconded by Bob. Um, any questions on this? And I think we had the delegation today and there will be further discussions with staff mm -hmm. and Senator Wellington, I believe. Bruce? Sorry, I had to find my, my uh, cursor. Oh. So I'll unmute myself, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, a question I was gonna ask earlier, the, the delegation did make reference to their, their work with Woolwich Township. Is there, have they approached Senator Wellington? I just wondered if Ian was aware, do they work with uh, Senator Wellington at all in terms of, of maintaining and monitoring the trails uh, that go through their, their area? Um, I am aware that they are working with the township and that um, they have a very amicable relationship. And um, that's about all I know. And actually, Sam's got a bit of a presentation here. So let's go through that and see if there's any further questions. Sam, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just gonna ask Pam, the Manager of Conservation Operations. Um, oh. there we go. Hi, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, um, I've got a bit of a presentation to have today. So our visitation management pressures have been growing in conservation areas for a few years now. Population increase and public demand for outdoor recreation has us looking to strategize how best to serve our customers while maintaining our park assets. The spring of 2020 and the outbreak of COVID forced us into the creation of strategies that focused on capacity, site restrictions, and essentially limiting the number of people in our areas to a reasonable level that staff can safely manage with COVID and physical distancing parameters. This action of creating capacity plans also complemented GRCA's subtle shift in our philosophy of the recreational properties that were being known as Grand River Parks to return to our roots of being known as conservation areas. It's our belief that each park has a capacity which is based on an estimated number of users that a recreation resource can accommodate while maintaining the quality of the recreational experience and avoiding unnecessary resource degradation. These two actions, the pandemic and the subtle shift, have forced us to really examine who's using our conservation areas and how they're being accessed. A few noticeable items issues came to light as a whole, but really one big item was how people are accessing the Allure Gorge Conservation Area. Unfortunately, many users enter at the northeast side of the conservation area, closest to the downtown of Alora. Not only residents, but tourists, Grand Valley Trail users, those who are staying over at the mill, even walking and hiking clubs that charge separate fees to guide groups 
in our conservation area. We're accessing the park without paying a gate fee and through a hole in the fence. This has been a challenge at the gorge since its inception in 1954. However, the, as the pandemic has moved on, the numbers of people accessing through illegal entry points has increased. Over the past 20 years, the Laura Gorge staff have tried many initiatives to put a stop to the fence cutting, including posting a security guard, constant repairing of the fence, signage, which often gets vandalized immediately. They've replaced and replaced again Education blitzes where staff friendly inform those trying to enter that the real entrance is off of County Road 21. We've increased security on the trail systems and we've even blocked the trail systems with cut trees and other natural ways to change the movement of people through the park. None of them have had a lasting impact. As part of our process to reduce our liability, risk, our cost recovery, we endeavored to eliminate some of the known sources of trespass. In June of 2020, we advised the Grand Valley Trail Association that in the absence of any existing agreements, they would be required to reroute their trail outside of the Gorge Conservation Area, and that we are no longer interested in having the trail group have access to the interior of the lower gorge of the conservation area, other than as paying customers who entered at designated entry points and that were manned by staff. We've offered their purchase of membership passes at group discounted rates for their members. The Lower Gorge is a pay for use area that thousands of adults pay $7.50 to enter for recreation, including hiking, and others are entering for free illegally. In 2020, over 80,000 paid day users visited the Lower Gorge. The day use fee or cost of the membership pass allows patrons to enjoy the clean washrooms, the maintained trails, the parking and picnic facilities, the support of staff and enforcement, the capacity plans for safe and physically distance enjoyment, and our patrol trails. This is a map of the Allure Gorge Park as a whole and the boundary is outlined in yellow. Karen, if you could move the cursor to the top of the page and show County Road 7. I don't know if you guys, if it'll work. Okay, so the cursor must not show up on the screen. Okay, um, so at the top of the page, you'll see there's County Road 7. And then to the left, like along the left side of the yellow boundary is actually a road, Middlebrook Road. So the park boundary is a county road. The red dot at the top of the map is where the Grand Valley Trail map shows that their group enters into the park. And the low red dot at the lower part of the map shows where they either exit or enter into the park again. The green highlighted dash is where Grand Valley Trail map shows their trail runs. In actuality, the trail, the Grand Valley Trail has placed their trail markers along the edge of the gorge fencing that's more closer along the river to get a better view of the gorge. And that's without authorization from park staff. And it's on an unmarked trail that isn't recognized staff nor is maintained by a lower gorge staff. Next slide. This group of pictures identifies the entry point that Grand Valley Trail Association shows on their map, which was agreed upon in the 2008 agreement, but that agreement is no longer valid. There's very little traffic here and almost none of it is observed by staff or no traffic has been observed by staff. You can see that there's a slight very slight path in the bottom right-hand picture. Next slide. The next slide shows where the trail picks back up on the far side on the map of, on the far side of the conservation area. It's located near our new campground and staff there have witnessed an increase of use in this area since COVID as people found the unopened road allowance and they like to park their cars there. And you'll see two cars in the background of this picture. Next slide. The next group of slides is near County Road 7, so closer to the town of Alora. And on each side of the gorge fence, this is consistently cut. 
It was most recently repaired on June 17th, and this photo was taken on June 21st. It's not known who cuts the fence, and we're not suggesting that it's trail members. But despite ongoing repairs, this continues to be a challenge for us. In 2020, over $8,000 was spent on repairs on the south side location, and the north side repairs were included in another project and had similar costs. Close to $20,000 is spent annually in fencing and signage at these locations. Next slide. <coughs> These two holes in the fence are near to the Pearl Diamond and the small municipal parking lot, and that's where most people seem to park. When our staff approach people at these locations, they are advised that, and they advise them that this isn't an entrance to a park, they get responses like, I've always entered here, I'm following the trail from town, I'm a local, I have a right to enter my park, I've received a guided walking tour from a website and I paid for this and it told me to come in here. I am a Grand Valley Trail member and I'm allowed to walk the trail. And there are many reasons that people choose to enter here, but none are permitted. An option to control this is security staffing with security guards. This would require a significant and incremental in expense and would require at least four teams of two on an almost 24 hour basis during our operating season and additional security outside of the operating season. This would lead to escalated actions ultimately that go beyond our educational approach to trespassing and ultimately provincial offenses, notices and charges under the Trespass to, Trespass to Property Act would ensue. That has not been our approach to date. And having a group like the Grand Valley Trail Association advertise their trail on a map adds to the confusion of people accessing the park illegally. Next slide. As further detailed in our board report, there's main reasons why we have designated entry points. One is by from legislation. GRCA conservation areas are designated through the board. Entry must be at designated entry points during operating hours and only by permit. All visitors require a permit, whether it's through day use, overnight camping, seasonal camping, or through an access agreement. We have issues of public safety. All visitors must be advised of the dangers of the gorge, and that's accomplished through signage at designated entrances, through notice in our membership packages, on the permit itself, we write it directly on the back of the receipt, and this notification is mandated due diligence as a result of a provincial inquiry related to an accidental death on the property. This notice can only be accomplished at designated entry points, and it's critical to helping us mitigate the risk of the gorge. You'll notice in this photo, it's taken of a rescue operation for a pet that fell over the edge of the gorge. GRCA pays a surcharge for any gorge rescues to the municipality for every EMS call, be it pets or people, and whether or not they've paid to enter the park. Capacity management, we have a commitment to follow our capacity plans and our operating plans to help reduce the risk to our staff and to support the provincial guidelines and public health measures. Trail users should be included in the number of people accessing the area, but if they're not entering at designated entry points, they can't be included in our visitation management strategy. Not adhering to the provincial guidelines can have significant fines associated with non-compliance. Capacity plans have been developed because of COVID or with COVID in mind, but likely they're going to continue on our properties in some format for the future. We get many requests for access at other conservation areas, but not to enter at a non-designated entry point. To date, no other GRCA conservation area has entered into an agreement for free or reduced cost. We do sell discounted memberships to groups like Rowan Clubs, but each purchase, person purchases a full membership, enters at the main entrance, and these groups have formal agreements. GRCA Nature Centers and GRCA Properties have also have requests from trail group users, and those are managed through arrangements through access agreements. These are non-revenue generating properties. GRCA's properties have 56 kilometers of GVTA trails 
and those are managed through the de property department. And discussions are ongoing with the property department to arrange and continue access on those areas. Other conservation authorities throughout the province have various arrangements. Some pay for use conservation areas allow trail users to walk through with or without agreement fees. Some have altered their existing agreements to ask that trails be rerouted away from popular areas. The waterfall properties in Hamilton Conservation Authority and the properties at CVC's Cheltenham Badlands, they are two examples where popularity has seen the trails rerouted away from the conservation area. Some municipalities have subsidized free access for their residents or trail users to enter into day use conservation areas. There is no one standard across Ontario. Many popular natural areas are suffering from the overuse and many landowners are not wanting to assume liability for the hordes of users and are canceling their agreements. The Avon Trail, the Bruce Trail have all posted updates where landowners have changed their mind about existing agreements and trails are now rerouted. Our conservation areas benefit from a shared revenue funding model where surplus revenues from one can first go to balance expenses of all and then the surplus is placed in the capital and sustainability reserve. As of December 31st, the CA reserve was at 3.1 million. It's anticipated that the capital program this year will require a drawdown of 1.5 million. And the Allure Gore has received its fair share of capital infrastructure upgrades over the past three years with close to 2.5 million in improvements to the septic system and in the development of the new campground. And with that campground came an additional gatehouse on the north side, fully opened for the first year this year. In terms of operational needs and risk assessments, the next item of large capital expender at, at Lower Gorge would be the repair, repair replacement of the low level bridge that was damaged in the flood events of 2017 and again in 2018. And our staff resources and financial resources are part of our lean operations. We seek to maximize our revenues by sharing them across the 11 conservation areas that need support for either operations or capital upgrades. And with all partnerships, there needs to be two parties that agree who can work together. The former agreement with the Grand Valley Trail Association created challenges for us and rerouting the trail outside the park or having Grand Valley Trail members enter through our designated entry points and paying for entry is a preferred. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Very comprehensive report. Uh, we'll uh, put this out onto the, uh, the floor for questions or comments. Jane? Yes, um, very good report. Um, I just had a question. What what did what would it mean for the uh, the Grand Valley Trail Association if they did change their trail to go through a designated entry point? I, I can see that that goes along the north of of the uh, you know the Lower Gorge, but you know there is an entrance. Can they change that? Are they they willing to change their trail so that it will go through a designated point? For you, Mr. Chair, I I don't know what they're willing to do. We have provided those options to them and have provided that back when we first um, had our discussions over a year ago, suggesting that it either enter on the County Road 21 entry point or that we were designing the Middlebrook Road entrance on the north side. So I, I can't answer for them what their interest would be about that. So there is going to be a new entrance then on Middlebrook Road? Is that... And my understanding because what you showed was pretty much not trail. Yeah, there is an um, opened entrance on Middlebrook Road on the north side near the new campground. Okay, so they could come in and they, the other one, the southern one, and then walk all the way up to the northern one then if they change their trail. And I'd have to see the rest of the trail where it is. So it doesn't have to be that way that they want. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll clarify as we go forward with them exactly what, because we saw a presentation today, maybe they're making a change. We'll, 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 we'll see what that is. Um, yeah, I think that would be good after hearing about all the other 
other things that go on. And certainly from Waterloo, it keeps coming up every once in a while. Why can't we go into Laurel Creek for free? You know, the city's now building another park somewhere else and it's kind of bubbles underneath. And, you know, maybe the city could pay for people to go in, but that's not happening yet. You know, and I'll get to it one, one second. I think we have to keep in mind that this isn't an isolated problem in one area. This is a huge watershed with a ton of parks. Yeah. And if you start letting people walk in anywhere they want to go, we're exposed to all the various liabilities and problems and staffing uh, strengths. We're, as you may know, I've got a battle going on on passive property where they're not even supposed to be. So uh, going forward, one of the things we've discussed with Sam and once we finalize with the provincial legislation and stuff, and it's one of the items we talk about, we have to come up with a strategy around our properties which may require a greater budget for security and the rest of it. And every time you sign an agreement that breaches basic protocols, you got to enter through the park uh, gates so you can properly inform the et cetera, makes it impossible to keep, keep everything in mind. It's the old broad brush, right? Sometimes it may not make sense in this particular instance, but unfortunately in order for it to work, you've got to have broad brush. Anyway, Ian. Uh, thank you, Chair White. Uh, just a little bit of um, history. Um, prior to the, um, the new bridge going across the Grand River as part of the Allura Bypass on Wellington Road 7, the main entrance to the Gorge Park was off of Wellington Road 7. Growing up in Allura, that was where our school used to go through to do our field events in the GRCA Park. And so the reason you're seeing so many people cutting oh. holes in the fences, and they are Center Wellington citizens who are doing it, is because it is the closest access to the park rather than walking all the way down Wellington Road 21 to go in through the new park gate. Similarly, the entrance, the new entrance on Middlebrook Road is too far for people from town to walk in. The other thing we're seeing in the township is it's also visitors to the Gorge Park who are staying overnight who are also walking into town through the Gorge Park holes in the fences. So we prefer to have a a legitimate entrance on Wellington Road 7 that people pay to go through. That also saves traffic from the Gorge Park coming into the town because we're already full in terms of trying to find parking. So we're looking at having some sort of arrangement with the GRCA where we're gonna help to invest in putting in some sort of a legitimate um, gate on Wellington Road 7 that satisfies the GRCA concerns, hopefully it stops the holes in the fences and the GRC gets revenue, we address their liability concerns, and at the same time, we're offering an entrance close to our town for locals and visitors to access the park. Um, as far as the GVTA goes, uh, what I heard in their presentation is they're willing to redirect their maps to show that you have to come out on Middlebrook at side road three, walk 250 meters, go in through the pine bush entrance. The issue is how they get out at the other end. If we're able to establish this official third entrance, then they can run their trail straight through the park and out the other gate. So I'm just putting that one out there. Okay, Ian, thank you. Um, sorry, who is Jeff? Yeah, thank you, Chris, and good morning, everyone. Just on your point, Chris, I think we really, really have to be careful about these dangerous precedents. It scares me just to even think that we're, we're talking about it. You know, the city of Waterloo controls all the zoning around uh, Laurel Creek. They built all those homes over there. And if they want to buy a membership pass, an annual pass for every resident in Waterloo, I think that would be great. But we need to be very careful and we need to remember what our core value is and why it's there in the first place. Everything else is just auxiliary, mm -hmm. all, all the camping and everything else. So uh, it's happened at Snyder's Creek, as we're aware. Same thing. And um, we've just picked up a new airline at our uh, international airport. And the city has built uh, homes in uh, that area, right up to the Grand River on the other side of the river at the airport. And that uh, poor, uh, <laughs> the poor local councillor is just getting phone calls after phone calls. And I'm sure all of us will eventually. But so we, we need to, um, we can't control what municipalities do with their zoning. We need to stick to what we're good at and stick to our, our basic values. And if, uh, you know, I, I would never support uh, allowing people just because they live in an area to be able to get free access. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Warren? Thank you, uh, Chair White. Um, 
The Allura Gorge is certainly one of our gems and our jewels in our watershed, very popular. Uh, and therefore success often brings problems. And this is one of the problems that, that is something to, um, that we need to address. I get really upset whenever I see holes and fences. I wanna know who the people are who are carrying around heavy duty wire cutters in their backpacks. Like I think, you know, Ian, did, I don't know if I heard you right. Did you say you would go and monitor that on the weekends? <laughs> yeah, I, sure, I can go and watch and see who's doing it. I have an idea who some of them might be. Yeah, I think it is a, a bigger problem than just the Grand Valley, Grand Valley Trails Association. There are other people who are not abiding by the rules. I think the G, the Grand Valley Trails Association is, is willing to work with us. But I think how do we combat the bigger problem of more people and it's going to increase in the future. Thank you. Uh, Sue? Thank you and through the chair. So very good information. Pam, you did a great job. Thank you for that clarification. So now let's imagine that we implement the MOUs with the municipalities. And uh, the LOI doesn't want to take on this. Does it become a free for all then? What is the damage done? And I think the province has to realize this. Who handles the liability if we're not allowed as a GRCA to take it on, the municipality has to take it on, and the municipality refuses to? Who becomes liable then? This is a prime example to give to the province. Well, I was shocked, Pam, when you said that somebody's dog fell over and you had to rescue and pay the charges. That's an example we have to give to the province. Who's gonna take the liability? Who's gonna pay those charges? Who's gonna be responsible? So this is a really valid point to think about in the changes of the Conservation Act. Thank you, Sue. Okay, so uh, again, we've got quite a problem here. We've got a specific issue, but we know we've got a, a broader issue. I just wanna, uh, I'll do this on behalf of the board. Thanks staff for, for taking on, this is an incredibly tough job. And it's not just here, it's almost at all of our parks now. And some, some folks can be fairly aggressive and it's really tough for them to do their job and they get blamed. And I think, again, this is a future problem. This is gonna, this is gonna go beyond COVID. And I think we're gonna have to come up with some fairly firm policies around that. that you wanna have proper entrances and all of those things because if we do talk about liability and we're allowing activities to occur, if, if there's an unsanctioned entrance to a park and then we put a fence up and it's on a trail. Well, somebody else will cut a hole because it's quasi sanctioned because you're using it. So I think that we need to support staff on this and we've got some liabilities here. That said, I think we all still absolutely support the recreational uses that we have and nobody here is anti-trail. We want these to succeed. They're a key part of why people live rural and we want to keep going with that. So we just need to make sure that um, uh, we support staff and try to find a way through with each of these groups. But at the end of the day, we have to protect protect uh, our, the corporation here. So if there's nothing for, sorry, Joan, la, uh, go ahead and then we'll move along. Thank you. I, I just wondered, Mr. Chair, I think we should continue to work with the delegation. Um, she said right at the beginning of her presentation, they're willing to have agreements for this, 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 and this. However, I also think if we're, if we continue to just fix these cut fences, maybe we should consider in, in the areas where they're accessing a different kind of fence that they can't cut. And maybe that's more expensive than chain link, but if we're spending $20,000 a year fixing fences, I don't know if that would work or not, but it's just something that I thought of. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And, and with regards to this, clearly we'll be talking to the uh, Rand River again and trying to get some clarity. Obviously, uh, they've got a new pro proposed route today with their presentation. And in, to Ian's comment, I mean, we'll be in discussions with Senator Wellington. If there's a solution there, we'll follow it up. We're, we're always willing to talk, but there is a point when you've got to make a decision and, uh, and move along. So if there's nothing further, we've got this uh, report for information. I'm going to ask if there's any opposed. That is carried. And thanks again, Pam, for all the work you're doing out there. We appreciate it. 
Okay, moving along to 1211 uh, regarding the hunting program. Motion that the Grand River Conservation Authority remove the Crawford tract from the list of Grand River Conservation Authority properties that are available for permitted hunting effective September 1st, 2021. Moved by John, seconded by Ian. I'll throw it open for questions. If there are no questions, I'll ask any opposed. That is carried, thank you. Emerald Ash Boer, I'm gonna get it right this time. We have a presentation from Rod Wu Winter with regards to the Emerald Ash Boer and we'll do the presentation first. So I'll turn the floor over to you, Ron, if you're all right with that. Great, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so there's, there should be a slideshow coming up, uh, but first thanks for the opportunity to provide an update uh, to this meeting with such a full agenda. I guess if there's any good news when it comes to Emerald Ash Borer, it's a challenge that at least now is in, in large part behind us. Um, Stephen McQuig, our superintendent of our boar culture and I were gonna do this uh, presentation together today, but unfortunately he lost his grandfather recently and wasn't able to join us. Um, next slide, please. So I imagine many of you have sat through your share of Emerald Ash Borer presentations over the, uh, can you go back one? The past 10 or 15 years. So I won't spend too much time on the background, but um, emerald ash borer was first detected in North America in 2002 and within our watershed in 2010 in Kitchener, Brantford, and on GRCA's Pushlands tract. The beetle kills nearly all the ash trees it infests uh, through damage caused by its larval stages under the bark. Um, hundreds of millions of ash trees have been lost in Eastern North America, and this has cost public agencies and uh, private landowners hundreds of millions of dollars. Next slide. Um, so there's been significant environmental costs as well, um, mainly of reduced forest diversity and resilience and also reduced overall tree cover, especially in our urban areas. Next slide. The GRCA's, the GRCA's strategy to deal with EAB has had six main components. And these components are similar to what uh, many other municipality and conservation authorities in Southern Ontario had in their strategy. And we were aware from the beginning, um, from very early on, that the hazard tree removal component was going to be the one by far that required the most uh, resources and staff time. Uh, next slide. And one of the very early significant challenges was to forecast just how big a liability dead and dying ash would be across all of our land holdings and whether we'd have resources to deal with hazard trees in a timely manner. Um, early forecasts that we did of, for the resources required were often based on sampling um, of our conservation areas or trails, which we then extrapolated over a large number of properties. Um, over time, with the development of GRCA's tree risk management plan and improvements to our tree, um, our hazard tree inventory program, we've been much more precisely been able to forecast uh, manage and track hazard tree removals over time. And I think it is safe to say that GRCA's tree risk management program is, is stronger and more effective now than prior to EAB. And a lot of that credit or most of it goes to Stephen McQuig, the Arborist crew, and also the GRCA's geomatic staff. Next slide. So one of the first elements of the strategy was to get a handle on where Emerald Ash Borer was present throughout our watershed. Um, by 2013, 2014, trapping had confirmed that the beetle was widespread through the, through the southern two thirds of the watershed, even though many of those areas were not showing signs of infestation. Northern areas were somewhat slower and we didn't trap Emerald Ash Borer at Bellwood until 2015 and at Luther Marsh until 2017. Next slide. In 2013, um, we started uh, a treatment program to protect potential future ash seed trees along with other benefit these trees were providing. Uh, by 2015, we had a set of 178 trees located on 19 GRCA properties. And I described the treatment results as fair. I think in the report, I was a little more optimistic and I said fair to good. Um, at the end of last summer, 80% of the treated trees were alive and 84% of those had good crown vigor the last time we treated them. Next slide. And one of the elements uh, was tree planting on our properties. And the GRCA plants trees on our CAs and other lands as a regular ongoing activity, uh, but faced with the pending loss of ash, one element of the strategy was to augment those plantings. And in this picture, you see a line of mature ash trees at Pinehurst Conservation Area. 
under which a number of tall stock trees from our nursery were planted in anticipation of, of the loss of these ash. And those ash are all now long gone. Next slide. So as I mentioned, one of the biggest challenges of the AB strategy was assessing just how large a risk and liability dying ash were gonna be on our properties. And although of course we were concerned with the loss of all trees, it's really the potential hazard trees, which were the ones that were gonna demand our resources. And whether a tree is considered a hazard really depends on its location. If it falls or a part of it falls, could it hit someone or something? Um, next slide, please. So both in the development of the tree risk management plan and to get a better handle on the risks of emerald ash borer, um, we, we mapped this series of tree risk zones across all of our properties. And here you see Bing Island's uh, risk zones with the red high risk zones around campgrounds, the pools, the roads, and a medium risk zone along one of the forest trails. So these are the zones where if a tree falls, uh, we know that it will likely present some hazard tree risk. Next slide. But the unique thing about um, you know, the pending emerald ash borer infestation is now we had a situation where virtually all ash trees present in those zones were gonna become a hazard over the next decade. So in 2014, we started inventorying ash in these highest risk zones on our properties, a process which would eventually extend across almost all the hazard zones on GRCA lands. And Bing Island was one of our worst of our CAs with 2,600 ash located in those hazard zones. But this inventory system has been a real powerful tool in forecasting, managing, and tracking those required hazard tree removals across all of our lands. So the blue dots are the ash trees present in these hazard zones. Um, next slide. And now you'll start to see some yellow dots, and those are where the trees have been removed. Um, so this is by 2016, we've taken out um, some of the most dangerous trees or the highest risk trees. Next slide. And by this March, um, this is the, the situation at Bing, with virtually all hazard tree ashes having been removed, other than I think uh, around 10 treated trees. Uh, next slide. So what does that look like on the ground? Um, uh, well, a picture of the Willows Campground is gonna come up. And this was the Willows Campground in 2016, and it should have been called the Ashes Campground. And you can see the trees are already thinning here in 2016, but this is what that area looks like now in 2019. Uh, next slide. So this is that area now and you can see that a lot of the tree cover is gone and at least five of those remaining trees are actually treated ash trees. All right, next slide. So that was the work that uh, our arborist crew was tasked with managing over the past eight years. And they and contracted arborists have removed over 16,000 hazard ash trees from our properties. Uh, just over 11,000 of those were in our conservation areas and around nature centers, 3,000 uh, on other GRCA lands, and 2,000 um, around the cottage lots and the associated roads. Next slide. And the cost of those removals and associated inventory work to date has been $2.8 million, with an estimated $400,000 remaining. And this is significantly lower than our earliest estimates, which put the removals at uh, anywhere between five and $8 million. Um, another $250,000 has been spent um, on the treatment and restoration elements of the strategy. Next slide. So between 2014 and 2018, um, these removal costs were covered under a combination of existing operating budgets and funds from the forestry or conservation area reserves. In 2018, the GRCA requested and was given permission by the province to use up to 1.8 million from the land sale proceeds reserve uh, for the increased management of hazard trees. And this was for all species of trees, not just specifically ash. In the end, 1.66 million was used from the reserve. Uh, so you'll also see in the report that around 200,000 of forecast removal expenses was eliminated or deferred through area closures and forestry operations. And it's anticipated that this remaining $400,000 of estimated ash removals will be covered under existing operated budgets over the next uh, two to four years. So after eight years of some pretty heavy lifting, uh, we're now in view of the finish line when it comes to ash removals required due to emerald ash borer. I think the Arbor staff obviously have a lot to be proud of for rising to this challenge. Um, but unfortunately, you know, even after a job well done, the loss of these ash trees has had significant negative impacts on many of our properties. And this, in addition to the, all the money spent on tree removals, has been this high cost of uh, 
the introduction of this non-native insect. Uh, and with that, I'll say thank you. Thank you, Ron. That's a fantastic presentation. I'm sure there's, uh, it's nice to see that we might be coming to the end of this as, as bad as it was to get here. I'll start questions with Bernie. Yeah, thank you very much for the a good presentation. And it's not only with the conservation authority that we have the expenses. Our municipality alone has removed a number of trees to our detriment uh, for our community because we thought we were known with good trees. Several questions on the uh, emerald ash borer. The treatment cost would appear to be prohibitive to be fully. What is the future of the ash tree? And uh, second question, with regard to that replanting grant, I know last uh, meeting I got a response that it was gonna be a joint effort by the conservation authorities. How are we making out with that grant? Um, I'll, well, I'll answer your first question in terms of what the long um, term forecast is for ash. And this is a crystal ball question. So, um, but I think we could be looking at a, sim a situation similar to um, uh, elm. So elm were hit by Dutch elm disease and you know the, the population was decimated, but there still are elms on the landscape and uh, much less than previously. And lots of young elms come up and some of those survive and some of them also get killed by Dutch elm disease. So kind of in the near term, I think we expect a similar uh, situation with ash that um, there will be ash on the landscape mm -hmm. Um, but how the d dynamics with emerald ash borer work out is still something we're going to see over the next 10 to 15 years. It could be that um, some of these introduced insects that have been introduced for control or some of our native insects will control emerald ash borer and it'll be less of an impact. But, you know, that's something we're going to see over the next 10, 15 years. And I'm not, I'm not sure in terms of the tree planting grant, which one you're referring to and whether I can answer that question or not. The two billion tree um, program. Oh, okay. Um, so the two billion tree program. I mean, that's still in development. But Forest Ontario, who, who we've been working with for the last 15, 20 years with subsidizing tree planting and reforestation, um, has a proposal forward um, to administer or uh, some of this two billion tree program that the federal government is proposing. So. We expect kind of a similar situation to what we've had, but I guess that's still to be seen as well. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. John? Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just want to thank Ron for a, a very comprehensive report. I've, you know, we have this issue in our community as everybody on the call does. Uh, I happen to live in a 40 year old neighborhood that was at the time it was constructed. Uh, the only tree that was planted was was the emerald. I'm uh, sorry, it was the ash, and of course we've lost uh, most of them now. One of the things the town of Milton did that that uh, GRCA may want to give consideration to is uh, we've started a program with uh, with taxpayers where for uh, a, a donation equivalent to the uh, the cost of replacing the tree, uh, they get a tax receipt. And the program has had, uh, I'll say modest take up, uh, but it's a kind of program given what GRCA's mandate is that may in fact have more interest and more participation uh, amongst those who, who support GRCA financially in other ways. And it might be a consideration to, uh, to start a program that is uh, dedicated to replacing uh, the GRCA tree canopy. Uh, that may be one way to get uh, the canopy back, but uh, Ron, I just want to say it's a, it's a great presentation. I, I plan to share it with with uh, the staff at the town of Milton because uh, uh, you've raised some really interesting uh, perspectives through the research that you've done in replacing uh, the trees uh, on GRCA property. And, and thank you, and thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, John. Catherine. Uh, thank you, and through you, Chair, I also thought this was an excellent presentation. Um, a comment first. This is a true example of an, ex, uh, an invasive species and the devastation 
across our watershed, across our municipalities that are membership in our GRCA um, uh, family here that are all reeling from the costs of this invasive species. And again, um, to the point earlier that we discussed about needing a comprehensive and cohesive strategy from all municipalities along this watershed. This is a true example of why that's needed. And this needs to be brought forward during our example with our delegations with the minister and with the ministry. I had an opportunity when I was this minister to tour the Invasive Species Centre in Sault Ste. Marie. And I actually got into the very highly secure area to actually visualize these beautiful emerald green insects that has created so much devastation across our province. Um, and again, this has to be an example of why we need um, these comprehensive strategies across our area. My, my question to Ron is, what are the ongoing costs of continuing to treat the ash trees that we still have that are as healthy as can be? So what is the ongoing cost going to be to continue to treat these trees and maintain them over the uh, next few years? So we have been spending um, anywhere between around 12 and $15,000 a year on um, the chemical costs for the treatment of these ash trees. Um, that will drop a little bit because as time goes on, we are going to um, select you know, the most likely survivors. And we have some places where the trees look amazing and you know all the trees around them are dead and then a few locations where you know treatments haven't done as well so we will over time bring that down i don't know what to expect it might be you know 120 130 trees so in that case it would be in the range of probably eight to twelve thousand dollars a year for the chemical costs alone plus plus staff time thank you okay thank you warren yeah thank you uh, mr chair um each month during the COVID, I've been look forward to our meetings because of the unbelievably good presentations that staff do for us. And I was thinking, how would we get all that information that we hear to the rest of the hundred, the millions of people in our watershed? Comment only. Sam, comment only. All right, why don't we leave it at that? Uh, yes. Jane has her hand up. Yeah, Jane. Yeah, um, my question is with the emerald ash borer, as all the trees disappear and the other ones are treated, will we eventually see the end of the emerald ash borer just because there'll be nothing left for them to eat? Unlike Dutch elm disease where the disease kind of just hangs around, will we just see the end of the emerald ash borer and maybe those trees that have been saved will, you know, start seeing them throughout the watershed again? Um, I, I think it's unlikely that emerald ash borer will disappear. Um, part of the reason for that is like elm, ash trees um, start developing seed quite early on. And, you know, if you go in underneath some of these ash now, there are hundreds or in some cases, thousands of ash saplings coming up. Um, mm -hmm. They will eventually grow. They'll support some EAB population, you know, unless some disease, uh, really takes hold somehow that, but I suspect it'll be more like Dutch elm disease, that it'll be a persistent thing. Um, it could be that, you know, to what extent ash survives, ash will survive, I think. I think that is quite clear, but I think it is equally likely that emerald ash borer is here to stay. So my next question then is, is it worth treating these trees forever? And, and have uh, forever of these trees when, if as soon as you stop it, they'll die? Well, it's a valid question and, and the strategy over the long term for treating isn't clear. It could be that emerald ash borer populations drop low enough that we can stop treating for a while, or maybe we can reduce how much chemical is used as a preventative treatment. Um, but that that's a question that's gonna have to be answered over time. And I think right now we're just dealing with, um, you know, we've, we've preserved some of those trees. They're there. As the situation becomes more clear, we can make those decisions. Okay, thanks. And the other thing I just wanted to mention is that uh, the Grand River uh, Conservation Foundation does have a program where you can buy a tree in memory or just a tree, and it will be planted somewhere on the watershed, just so, just so you know. 
and uh, people definitely get a tax receipt for that, I believe. At least I think I did when I did it. So just passing that along. Thank you, Jane. Guy? Uh, there. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, Ron, um, I'm going to change direction a little bit. Uh, once again, excellent report. But I, since you've been monitoring the Emerald Ash Borer throughout the uh, watershed, have you uh, um, had any insight into what the European gypsy moth is doing throughout the watershed? Just a quick, mm -hmm. word, if, if I, it may be inappropriate. Sure, from one non-native invasive species to another. Um, well, and, and uh, I can comment a bit, and this could be another 10 minute presentation. So, but, in general, um, gypsy moth has been bad across Southern Ontario starting last year. But in the Southern half of our watershed, that really started three or four years ago. And gypsy moth is highly cyclical. In general, uh, tree mortality of deciduous trees doesn't tend to be that high, but it can grow as the infestation lasts longer. Um, but if this infestation is like all the others we had, at some point in the near future, it'll, it'll crash because of diseases. We just don't know when. Um, but so the southern half of the watershed, I think, is a concern because it, it has had this infestation for quite a while. Uh, we're going, Pinehurst already in 2018 was seeing what the rest of the watershed is seeing now. Um, and that's why we chose to treat at some of those properties. But I guess um, what I've seen, and like I haven't driven all the watershed this spring at all, um, but the remainder of most of the areas north of Cambridge, I would really describe the infestation as moderate still. And because it's early on, I think there should be less concern about tree mortality. That's not to say individual trees won't get nailed and people aren't gonna be frustrated because their tree is naked and caterpillar droppings are dropping on their head. But I, I think it's not as serious. Um, we'll see that the Ministry of Natural Resources flies all of Southern Ontario every year and they map the defoliation. So we get those in the fall usually to see how bad it was this year. And for us, like if municipalities are making decisions on whether to treat next year, I think they really need to be based on how badly was a property impacted or a portion of a property this year. And also, if you really wanna know what's gonna happen next year, the best thing is to be doing egg mass counts in the late fall and winter, which is the best predictor of next summer's population. Um, but yeah, the crash should come, but when that's gonna come, it's hard to say. Already back in 2019, I was seeing a lot of dead caterpillars at, at Pinehurst and some of our other properties, but that, you know, there was a lot of live one as well. So the in terms of defoliation right now, this is gonna be the worst of it. End of June, they tend to stop eating. And now we just have the moths to look forward to for a few weeks. And then uh, a lot of the trees will start putting back on leaves in the next couple of weeks. Uh, thank, thank you for that update, Ron. And I guess, I, could I just su suggest later in the fall when we maybe have an idea of how the report from the Ministry of Natural Resources and that, if we maybe have another update just to, to uh, let everyone know what to uh, expect next year. Thank you. Sure. Okay, guy, get ready for naked trees in Dufferin. Okay, Jerry? Thanks, uh, through you, uh, Chair White. Yeah, I'm driving along um, I guess it's old Highway 19 from Listowel to Stratford in Perth County. The county has obviously removed a, a number of these trees along the highway. It's, it is devastating to see. Ron, um, again, uh, excellent staff report as always from the staff here at the GRCA. Just curious, and maybe it is in the report, just a, a rough estimate, uh, 16,000 trees have been removed since 2014. Do you have a rough estimate of how many have been replanted? To, to help replenish. I'm not sure of that number, just a rough number. I know a lot of people will ask, oh, we see all these trees going down. Are, is, is someone replanting some? Just a rough guess. Yeah, so I mean, that's a little bit, so in, in our conservation areas, I would say, you know, we would do at least several hundred trees a year. And then I'd have to check back to what we did uh, in response to directly to Emerald Ash Borer. But on top of that, we have these really large reforestation programs and we're talking 100,000 trees a year. Some of those are not directly in response to Emerald Ash Borer, but often they are happening in, in areas highly impacted by, by the loss of ash. So, you know, it is that there it's an ongoing thing with the GRCA and um, you know, we're looking at a hundred thousand trees a year. If you want to know, you know, exact levels within our conservation areas, that's something I'd have to get um, other staff to, to provide. Oh, that's great. Thank you. 
Welcome. Okay, we'll, we'll take Helen and then we're, we're gonna move along. Helen? I'll be really quick, uh, Chair White. I, uh, Ron, I do appreciate the report. Uh, it's very wholesome. And I also appreciate you uh, off the cuff kind of giving us some good advice on gypsy moth because I think I was the one that I'm sure others may have gotten it as well. The letter where the woman was convinced they were attacking her whole family uh, 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 each time she entered her front door. Um, so I did hear, and maybe this is something you can confirm or even, uh, yeah, you can either confirm it or whatever, that at different stages of the gypsy moth, uh, there are natural ways of managing it. And I, I remember reading it once and it was quite a while ago, but I, I can't remember. Do, do you know about this, Rob? Um, I, yeah, if you're, if you're referring to uh, physical means, there are several things um, homeowners can do. Um, Individual trees can also be injected with uh, the same chemical that we use for uh, uh, emerald ash borer and others. Um, the, the, the physical means definitely help, and there are some good resources that people, and you know, we've been pointing them to those all through the spring. Um, but really, when you get these really significant infestations, like we've seen at some of our properties like Pinehurst, Brandt, um, those are all a drop in the bucket uh, you just really, you can't do anything other than, than what we've done in some areas, which is, is the spraying of this BTK. Um, but definitely individuals on their, their own properties can do things um, different times a year. And, and we do have some good resources that, uh, that we can forward to people. So I was just wondering if maybe there would be a reason, and I honestly, I don't think staff needs more to do, but because you know this, if we could get a resource page when these infestations start appearing, um, because I, I'm sure other representatives get these calls and questions all the time that just, you know, we can refer them to a page or something, Ron, that you, because you guys already know this stuff anyway, and it, and it's coming upon our parks people. So if even we had a resource page on the website where we could just direct people to, because here's what people worry about when they call us, it's because they don't want to either do something that they shouldn't be legally or uh, in a harmful way to, to natural, to, to natural uh, assets. Right. So so if we had something like that, we could direct them uh, immediately and say, well, this is, you know, these are natural remedies or this is what will do the least harm or whatever that looks like. Uh, I, I think it could be really helpful because right now, I mean, I'm doing my own research and laughing going, what, <laughs> what do I know about gypsy moths? <laughs> right. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, thank I think, I think we could augment our, our website to, to focus more on that and to help and both us. us and, and yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks Ron. You're welcome. Okay, uh, Catherine, go ahead. Thank you, just to uh, Helen's point and to make Ron's life a whole lot easier, the Invasive Species Center already has all this information in a very easily um, documented way. So you can just pull the resources from there or actually just share the link there. But it has photographs, the, the background quick tips about what to do with them, where to find them and how to manage and, and how to get rid of some of these from all the invasive insects and species uh, that we've got in Ontario. So there you go. Thanks. All right, thank you. And I think in this course would be for Sam and Karen to sort out, I think links might be better because while we're all concerned about this issue, we don't want to become the focal point for everybody's gypsy moth questions. We don't have the staff or resources, but if there are really good links, you can put a page up with the links and direct folks to, to those people, or um, we may get inundated and it may indirectly end up having some responsibility for it. So Ron and Sam and Karen, we'll leave that with you, but a page with some kind of really good links to help folks mm -hmm. out, I think would be very beneficial. Okay, so I have a motion that the report number GM062144, Emerald Ash Bore Strategy Implementation Update be received as information. Can I get a mover, please? Moved by Bernie, seconded by Joan. Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. Moving on to New Hamburg regulatory floodplain mapping. Motion that the updated New Hamburg floodplain mapping update completed by the GRCA be endorsed for use when dealing with planning matters and permit applications in the study area and that recommendations to the Grand River Conservation Authority regulation 15006 mapping be approved to incorporate the revisions to the floodplain and associated regulated allowance. Moved by Les, seconded by Bruce. Any questions? Any opposed? 
That is carried. Thank you. Current water shed conditions. I have a motion that report number GM 062152, current watershed conditions as of June 15th, 2021, be received as information. Moved by Brian, seconded by John. Uh, staff have any comments? Dwight, do you wanna say hello or just take questions? Just, Are there any questions? Yeah. Go ahead, I'll just, Dwight. I'll just take any questions. Okay. Only comment I would make through you, Mr. Chair, is we are expecting quite a bit of rainfall over the next five days, potentially between about 75 and 90, depending on um, the areas and, and embedded thunderstorms. So we're keeping a close eye on the incoming weather, but uh, it would like to be very welcome rainfall over the next five days. Well, we're going to hold you to it and we'll review those numbers next meeting. Okay. Um, if there's nothing further on that, I will ask, uh, are there any, did I get a mover and second? I did, didn't I? Are there any opposed? That is carried and thank you, Dwight. Um, so we're moving along to a closed meeting. I have a motion that the general membership enter a closed meeting to discuss a confidential matter. I move by Helen, seconded by Ian. Uh, we are, uh, are there any opposed? We are going into closed and 